everybody, you're listening to the Comic Book Bears podcast. I'm Bill Zanowitz. And I'm Steve Morey. And we are your hairy, heavy homos that talk about comic books, but you don't have to be a hairy, heavy homo to listen in. And we don't have Brother Brian with us this week, but we do have somebody more than ably sitting in his seat. Please welcome, for the first time to the show, though, he has been a regular contributor on the streams, so it doesn't feel like it's his first time. John <laughs> Runyon. John is from a comic book look podcast podcast and he's going to tell us about that and some other stuff before we get going so john thank you so much for joining us tonight thank you guys and again i've said it before i'm going to say it again it is humbling being amongst comic book royalty so, <laughs> thank you guys yes i don't Happy know about, here. i don't think we rank higher than lady in waiting <laughs> but okay <laughs> But. I hold the chamber pots. I guess it's my job. <laughs> and I make the stew. <laughs> And I <laughs> helped. Um, I don't know what, <laughs> what kind of creepy fairy tale we're putting together here? We do have a bunch of stuff to talk about tonight. Uh, we are in the midst of a few weeks into the TV season uh, that has seen particularly CW shows based on comic books, but you also have the cloud that's been hanging over everything <laughs> known as WandaVision and uh, some of those people. Oh, they, get, <laughs> they got disappointed, but you know. Uh, <laughs> they, have... Hi, James. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Yeah, the cloud of WandaVision Oh my god! I, I mean, oh, I thought I lost. I lost you there for a split second. Oh no, no. Um, okay. the, the 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 cloud of Wandavision. I'm glad that you called it that, mm -hmm. um, because I think there were so many fan theories floating around and like just really pushing themselves forward that I think uh, people started to think that that was going to happen. That yeah. everything that people were speculating about was going to happen, mm -hmm. and it didn't. I mean, some amazing stuff happened. I, I yep. think I think it was the whole the whole thing from beginning to end. I loved every episode. I was hanging on every word, every minute. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, and yeah, we can talk was, about that when we get into the segment. So yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, I'm I'm very excited to hear some stuff about John because I don't know. Uh, so John, uh, first of all, how, and this is the stock question we ask everybody the first time they come on the show. How did you initially get into comic books? Yeah, so definitely product of my uh, my my time during the '90s. That darn X Men cartoon, hook, line, and sinker, baby. So I tuned in Saturday morning. Jubilee's at the mall, freaking out, shooting her fireworks at a Sentinel, and I'm just like, this is the coolest <laughs> thing ever. And so I was hooked, and I'm watching those those episodes coming out right. And then um, actually, for comic books proper, it's really interesting. I actually we moved to Japan. So I started watching the X-Men cartoon when I lived in Nebraska. Dad's in the military. We moved uh -huh. to Japan to an Air Force base and they had one spinner rack um, at the little like uh, comment, not, not commissary. It was like a little shop at is what they called it. So it's like a little place to go get food that's closer to your house. And so I would always walk over there and I saw one day there's a spinner rack of comics. And so I had to start getting, getting my different issues. My first comic ever that I purchased over there and I still have it it is beat to all hell. I've read it so many times. I think I clipped a coupon off the back, potentially. But um, Uncanny X-Men 322 um, is the first issue, and that's where Juggernaut gets punched across the Marvel U by Onslaught. So this is right before the Onslaught event. Um, and uh, that was my first ever comic. So I still have it. It's proudly part of my collection. I don't imagine there's too much resale value on it because it's just been completely destroyed. Um, but from there, um, rocking with Uncanny, the normal X-Men line and X-Force. Those were my three steady Freddies. Um, started picking up some X-Factor, just learning more about the characters. But let me tell you what, that X-Men 90s cartoon was a real good introduction for me to really get passionate about some of those characters. Alpha Flight, met him for like, what, 10 minutes in that episode they were in. <laughs> and now I have a whole wall here. I have a whole wall dedicated to them. I love Alpha Flight. Um, yep. And so it's... Um, it's a really cool thing. You know, it's, it was a really cool mm, product. And I think absolutely. that a few of those shows did a really good job of highlighting those characters like Spidey or Silver Surfer, for that matter. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that's that's how I got into comics um, ever since then. Um, I did fall out during, like, high school and the college a little bit. Everybody kind of does. Mm -hmm. And then, boy, did I jump back in thanks to the Dark Avengers um, and everything. And all that was going on, I was like, man, this is awesome. And I just jumped right back in. So here we are. Um 
I, I love, love, love Marvel. I have dipped my foot into the DC pool, though, as you'll see tonight. I can try my best to hold my own. I'm no Bill, but I will do my best. <laughs> um, and honestly, I just, I read for the story. I read for the characters. And so that's the way that I see it. Um, I, there's a few X-Men runs that I struggled with over the past couple of years, but man, this new stuff is right up my alley. It's so great. I love it. Um, and so, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of my origin story with comics and, uh, definitely i just enjoy the community around it like for me buying the books is one thing that's cool but i love talking about it with other people like that's mm -hmm. my favorite part is meeting other people mm -hmm. that appreciate these things or if they have a different perspective tell me why because that's awesome too i love that and i've been exposed to several new titles uh by tuning into you guys to tuning into other shows so it's just such a robust community and a bunch of cool people all right yeah. now you mentioned you lived in japan did you get the x-men cartoon in japan um, so the X-Men cartoon itself did not come over in Japan, unfortunately. Our programming was very odd okay. over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so channels were a little different, but it was also cool. So I got to watch a lot of music videos on their MTV was called Channel V. Um, and so back when music was played on those stations, um, and it was a lot of fun just to see like how people were reacting to TLC's uh, fan mail album when that dropped with no scrubs. Oh my God, that was a hit. Uh, so it was it was good. Uh, Celine Dion's Titanic theme song that was huge. Um, you know, so it was just it was so fun to see how American artists translated into a different country, um, and it was so fun to kind of follow along and and uh, and see that. But yeah, for for Marvel content, not so much unfortunately. Um, Star Wars movies were huge, so when Episode One came out, oh. Oh, that was hot. And then the action figure re-releases that they started doing uh, mm -hmm. for Star Wars action figures. Oh, those were everywhere. That was cool. <laughs> okay, uh, the main reason I ask is because yeah. there is, a, and you can find it on YouTube, when the, when the cartoon did air, and I think there was a substantial period of time from when it aired in the States mm -hmm. to when Japan aired, it has a totally different theme song. Mm -hmm. And it's just, that's just amazing. That it's cry amazing. for the moon. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just amazing. Um, I think I think uh, you you may have exposed that to me a couple of months ago. Really? I okay. Out. I was freaking out a little bit, like, what is this? And it was my first time seeing it, and I was just like, this is awesome, you know. Uh, oh, I thought here is, we we finally had somebody who watched it contemporaneously. Oh, but oh well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you say you're a big Marvel fan. Yeah. What is the origin of your interest in the black light posters that are behind you? I got to know that. Yeah. So um. I actually used to do an interview series on Comic Book Look called Comic Book Look After Hours. And so I would interview comic creators um, and just do a one on one situation. So one of my creators was Gary Scott Beatty, who does a lot of like horror comics. Um, very nice gentleman. And we were talking and I'm looking in the background and he has like the sweet like Medusa poster. And it's all in video like you can I, I'll share a link to my reaction. It's all in that video. It's the funniest thing. But he just said, oh, John, watch this. My my wife is good to me. And he turns the, the light off and the black light <laughs> comes on and they all light up. And I'm just like, what is this? So he proceeded to talk me about this series of posters. So I got uh, one, two, three. And then um, I'm going to move my camera. Number four is right here. Um, I got two more in tubes in the basement. Um, so these four have been custom framed. And if anyone is wondering, when you go get something custom framed at Michael's or whatever, um, the glass actually does block rays, UV rays from entering in. So their Michael's glass blocked the black light from making that glow. So these all have special normal glass in them. So that way when I turn my black light on, it all lights up. So it does protect your photos when you go get things custom framed. Um, which is really interesting to learn. Um, the matting and everything was all custom. I just wanted something sharp and fun. Um, these Pop Funko ones were more recent with the new Pop Funkos they released. And then like the Doctor Doom you see over my shoulder on the bottom is a tribute poster to this series. And then I have another one with like Doctor Octopus too behind me. So all right, cool. But I just uh, I love them. I love yeah, them. The <laughs> The store that's closest to me, which doesn't have new comics, it's all old comics and <laughs> toys and stuff, uh, in in the old shop, but it's still displayed in the windows, they have the Silver Surfer and the Doctor Strange. Yes. And when I inquired about the price, I almost dropped it. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're crazy, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. I watched wow. them on eBay. Um, mm -hmm. The other two I got, one's a really cool um, uh, horizontal... Doctor Strange one, and it's kind of crumbly on the sides or whatever, but it was like a hundred dollar discount. And I'm like, okay, you know, 
fine. I'll take it. Because for me, I'm not looking for pristine. They're from the 70s. I get it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, and then the other one I got was uh, Namor, actually flying by the Statue of Liberty. Uh, <laughs> so kind of random and awesome. But yeah, so he's still in the tube too. But yeah, there's a couple more out there I want to get my hands on. So. All cool. right. Yeah. And hey, why we, don't you tell us? A... Oh, go ahead, Steve. Sorry. I, I was going to say, we, we've got a couple uh, a couple comments here, and this could probably lead right into the next question, Bill, that you have. But first, uh, uh, just as a, a quick note <laughs> to the earlier mention of uh, WandaVision, it was Agatha all along, which, of course, we knew, didn't we? But anyway, um, Brian Pittard stopped by. He is, you know, able to, to say hello, but unfortunately he can't stay. But looking good, guys. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when John was talking about seeing the, uh, the X-Men cartoon, <laughs> how young is John? Uh, we could speculate uh, about your age, yeah. but but we won't. You know, a lady doesn't re- reveal her age, exactly. of course. Exactly. Um, but, Especially uh, lady in waiting. <laughs> um, but James mentions here do you do they know that you've got your gay card canceled yesterday and so how <laughs> would that have happened so, I think Bill that kind of leads into your question uh, I'm guessing were you going to be ta- asking about a comic book look mm-hmm. <laughs> go ahead yeah, tell us yeah. about a comic book look and tell us how you got your gay card canceled I, I, it got it's canceled. very easy I, to reinstate I, that I, uh, a couple of uh, Lady Gaga <laughs> cookies and you're good Okay, I yeah. was wondering what the yeah. process was. Yeah. Uh, all right. So the draft uh, stamp envelope. <laughs> uh, so comic book look, you guys. Um, we've been going. We'll be ten years old coming up this summer, which we're so excited about. Um, so right up the, with there with comic book fairs. Um, and uh, a comic book look is myself, and then my co-pilot Tom Devine, and uh, we actually That's started. Cool. Uh, together at a prominent financial institution uh, here in town. Um, And we worked uh, just over the wall from each other, found out we both like comics, and then we both started exchanging comics that we were buying just to read them. And I would be talking about, man, Dark Avengers was so awesome. And he would argue with me, like, dude, this is so stupid. And (laughs) we finally finally decided, like, let's do a show about this because it's funny. Like, our coworkers were cracking up around us because we'd be making fun of each other. So... We started a comic book look with the premise of we don't really agree on much of anything, but we're going to have our opinions about comics. Uh, when we review comics, we hit it with a six out of six beer rating or five out of six, et cetera. So we do our beer ratings. So we've kept that tradition. Um, and it's really just been a really fun journey. Um, we, for a while there, we were uh, networking with like a site, a media site, Inveterate Media Junkie. So they were helping get get the word out about us too. Um, and then we just kind of went back to doing our own thing. But it was a great experience. We got a lot of cool viewers f- through there. We had a flag from Ireland shipped to us. So we had that displayed in the background of our original set for a while. So when people start mailing you stuff like, dude, thanks for being awesome. I'm like, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's so it's so humbling. Um, and so that's that's the main thing we've really enjoyed over the years is just connecting with people, getting to go to different cons and representing. Um, we've had uh, a few of our f- friends join in on the fun as well. Uh, Ken, who commented uh, just moments ago, here is actually my fiance. Um, so he was on the show uh, for a period of time as well. And uh, so he's he's probably tuning in right now, giggling at me downstairs. So. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, it's been a really fun journey. So if you guys are interested on in listening to just banter, opinions, and good old fashioned fun, I mean, we just we keep it very lighthearted, and um, yeah, we we're not afraid to throw a book under the bus if it's not good, or we'll argue about it if it is good. So yeah, so it's it's a lot of fun though, um, and we love having guests on. Uh, Bill and Steve were both outstanding guests, by the way, um, and I had several people tell me on the side they really enjoyed both of you. So oh, um, awesome! That's yeah, so well, nice to hear you. Uh, since I've bogarted everything, and again, we still have to hear about how you lost your gay card. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Steve, do you have anything for John there? Well, no, I, you know, I, we've, we've talked, uh, uh, Bill, uh, you know, when you and I uh, guested separately on, on Comic Book Look, it was just really great chatting with you and Tom. I think it was just, uh, it, it's really fun banter back and forth. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, you guys have a, a very, 
you know, very snappy repartee uh, <laughs> with each other, as well as about the, you know, about the books. Like there's a, there's just a really great cadence that you, uh, yeah. uh, that you talk about and show your excitement with the books. And I love that. Yeah. Um, but I do know that you are a huge Marvel guy. I mean, you know, that's where you kind of started. I think that's where a lot of us started, Bill. You I know, did. I think you, you started with but, DC. But it's also very interesting because there's a lot of parallels between John's story, uh, jumping on the X-Men and mm -hmm. me, 20 years earlier uh, jumping on the super friends and that yeah. being the ball that really got things rolling for me i mean I, I had some comics i still have a walt disney comics digest from 1972 mm -hmm. that somehow survived everything and mm -hmm. um but i i was like really like digging the parallels about you know how you know important something <clears throat> not in the medium that that we're talking about mm -hmm. um, in a connected medium really set the ball rolling into this mm -hmm. one. So I, there was a lot I appreciated with your story there. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. 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 But, uh, but I did want to ask, so you start with Marvel, you, you know, kind of, like you said, you, you'd gone away for a while and what brought you back was like dark Avengers and, yeah. uh, and, and that period, uh, that big Marvel event area uh, era that kind of happened with that. Yeah. Um, have you found some non-Marvel stuff that you just absolutely can't live without? Oh, uh, that I can't live without. You know, we were, you know, we were talking about this, you know, before the show. But I, I am just head over heels right now for our friends at Vault Comics, uh, which I know we might be talking about some titles later here. But uh, just the the quality and realness of the mm -hmm. stories are just so refreshing to me. So. Um, an example, I have a tunnel around here somewhere. I'm like looking through my pile now and I can't find it, of course. Oh, it's behind me, that's why. Um, uh, a tunnel is, is an example from Vault that I just, I love it because it's not superheroes. It's just, it's mm -hmm. a different, it's a different take on it. It's, it's still got some what is going on questions, but it also has rich characters. And that's what I read for is rich characters that just really grab me and say, you know, hey, check this book out. Um, so when, when a story draws me in, it doesn't have to be superheroes. Um, and I think that the Vault creative team, at least with this Nightfall series that they're doing, I haven't picked up one of the books yet that I haven't been happy with. So That's great. That's yeah. good. I, you know, and it's it, it's tough. It's it, Sometimes it's a tough transition, um, you know, and it, it kind of is sort of like the face of comics. A lot of people who don't read comics think <laughs> that everything's just superhero based. And if you don't like superheroes, then, well, there's nothing for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so much beyond superheroes and comics. It's just it's an amazing medium that you can do so much with. And, uh, you know, especially in the past 20 years, there's been a lot more sort of like an indie side. But there's mm -hmm. always been great indie stuff. I mean, you know, even, you know, uh, back, I, I mean, I, you know, we, we call it call them the big two, DC and Marvel. But there's also there was or was Charlton with their. Uh, with their superheroes, like way back when it was Fawcett with Shazam, until they got sued to oblivion, and, and DC got all of their got all of their stuff. Um, but you know, the superheroes kind of are, are yeah, you know, were usually a big thing. But you know, seventies with comics and eighties with like the huge indie boom, and mm -hmm. you know, there's just been some really great stuff that's come out that's uh, not necessarily superhero. And it's it's hard for a lot of people to make that decision or that, that transition sometimes mm -hmm. because you have to find that good story or those mm -hmm. good types of stories that, that make you want to... Mm -hmm. But I also think you see the, the revert. Yeah, I also think you see the reverse of that, though, that there is a breed of comic reader that doesn't ever mm -hmm. touch the superhero stuff. And God knows mm -hmm. there's enough oh, yeah. in the other bucket for them to, to stay satisfied. So, yeah. Um, and, and that wasn't something that was present in the eighties. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that's been something that's grown over time. Um, yeah. cause he, you know, even a lot of the indie stuff in the eighties, you know, whether it was American flag or John Sable or Nexus or mage, yeah. you know, there's a connect, you know, there's more connective tissue to superheroes. Mm -hmm. uh, than I think a lot of people are aware of. Uh, but. Elementals. Uh, that was one of my favorite, you know, eighties books that I just rediscovered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, no. Um, but yeah. to take on this, this burning question from Jay. <laughs> so thank you. Jay. <laughs> um, I, I opened up about how I procured a copy of, 
Paul Clean and Wiccan from this King in Black event or whatever. And I'm just like, I'm a horrible, I might be a horrible gay comic book nerd here, but like, I'm not familiar with them as a couple or as characters at all. So like when they entered the Marvel U, I wasn't reading any of their titles, like Young Avengers or whatever they were in. And so that just, yeah, James was just totally like, John, turn into your gay card now, you know? And it was just, it was so funny. But it's, it's so, you know, for me, I read it as a gesture of I want to get to know them and I'm sorry I'm late to the party, you know? So yeah. I might, I don't think I'll make their friend list or anything like that. And I probably won't get an invite to the wedding, and um, but you know, at least I tried. So, yeah, I <laughs> am with you in Young Avengers being a whole. Um, yeah. I know what happened, you know. Mm -hmm. Wikipedia is there for that, yeah. but um, <laughs> I I think I have read three issues, and I think in all of those cases, those were free digital. Yeah, ones. Oh, I I did lie. I do have the secret invasion crossover with runaways okay but i've never i've never read that mm -hmm. <laughs> at some point it was really cheap yeah. on, the, yeah. on the digital sale so <laughs> that's, that's funny because i would totally read that for the secret invasion involvement because that's what led to dark rain which is the love of my life um and then i also <laughs> love the runaways um i love I, I think a lot of the young characters have a lot of potential um, and Runaways, the, the thinking of the show on Hulu, I actually really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I liked it. It was cool. It was fun. It was something different because I never thought I'd see a show, you know? So, mm -hmm. oh, I'm yeah. watching Runaways. Oh, Cloak and Dagger. Oh, they're together in two episodes. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> you know? Um, and I never it, thought I'd see yeah. the day. So, I'm just appreciative, I guess, with that. But um, yeah, that's that's funny. I'll have to check and see if I can find that now, Bill. God, you guys always get into me into trouble. <laughs> recommendations. It's only three issues, well, so yeah, it, it won't yeah. really break the bank for you. So that's a good. Point. Well, and, the, and I do have to say that if you if you are interested in sort of like a more a deeper dive, I mean, obviously your children children's crusade and all of that stuff, but um, the really big, good to me, the great Young Avengers run was, of course, the McKelvey and, and Gillen Young Avengers series. I think it was only what like sixteen issues. Um, 16, 17 issues. It was really short, mm. but it's like just that one year, uh, mm. and you get to love those characters so much. And I think that came out maybe 2016, 2015. It was something around there. Um, but excellent, excellent, excellent stuff. Uh, and actually, James has another note there. Young Avengers were literally a police case here in 2019. <laughs> then Mayor of Rio tried to get the Children's Crusade book banned from a book fair because it showed two gay characters kissing. Mm. Ooh, well, mm. sounds just like uh, you have some of uh, the one million moms uh, also in Brazil. Yeah, uh, One million moms, which is like three people. So it's... Yeah. <laughs> and John followed up with, uh, sorry, James followed that up with the book sold out, yeah. obviously. The book sold out, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Controversy is also great advertising mm -hmm. and marketing. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we mentioned the Runaways TV series, so that's a good transition okay. over to other TV series that we should talk about. Uh, over the past few months, uh, yeah, it's been, I, I guess, probably the first of this wave was Pennyworth, maybe? Was Pennyworth mm -hmm. the first one to premiere? Pennyworth, uh, Pennyworth or Riverdale, or Riverdale, they were both really close, but it was right after the yeah. first of the year uh, that we did mm -hmm. get basically a return of uh, comic book based TV, and unquestionably the biggest event out of those uh, out of these series that we're going to be talking about is WandaVision, which completed its mm -hmm. run last Friday. Steve, why don't you give us a little background on WandaVision? Well. Uh, simply put, WandaVision is a nine-episode uh, meditation on the meaning of trauma and the processing of, you know, PTSD and grief. Uh, but it's also an amazing Marvel Cinematic Universe, the first MCU, like, fully integrated MCU TV series um, that has been produced by the Marvel film studios, the Marvel studios, mm -hmm. not the TV studios, but Marvel studios that, that handles the films under Kevin Feige. Um, this was their first series and it tells the, it, it shows the, yeah. the quality was mm -hmm. brilliant. Um, the, you know, you're using the exact same uh, cast 
Uh, you know, the, the predominant cast is, of course, you know, straight from the films. Um, and the production quality is just gorgeous. The special effects, everything is, is it basically makes it a nine part film, mm -hmm. something that you could see, you know, actually happening on on the big screen, uh, which we didn't have to because it's also, uh, you know, a wonderful um, look back uh, kind of a love letter to the history of TV in America as well because each episode uh well most most of the episodes well yeah follow, particularly sitcoms uh, yeah particularly sitcoms, sitcoms uh family sitcoms um <laughs> how you know from the 50s 60s 70s and all the way up to the 2010s um you know with different styles obviously uh for the episode in which wanda uh and vision and their growing family <laughs> um participate in and you know just kind of play with all of those tropes from those eras uh well, at the same time, you know, reality starts poking through uh, and interfering with this fantasy that she's uh, that Wanda is living out uh, with Vision. Um, but uh, some amazing cameos from some great upcoming characters. We had um, uh, Monica Rambeau um, showing up as uh, first a sword agent who. Uh, you know, was re, you know, coming back after the blip. She actually had disappeared during the blip. Um, we had uh, Randall Park's character, uh, the FBI agent from Ant Man 2, also making an appearance and having a much stronger presence. And uh, then, of course, good old Darcy. We love Darcy from the first Thor movies. Um, she is uh, also, um, she also showed up to uh, have a pretty impactful presence in this series as well. Um, introducing again some new uh, side characters for the Marvel Universe, um, and uh, you know a really big side character for the Marvel Universe that uh, probably will become one of the new sort of Avenger characters as well, uh, and an interesting villain who didn't necessarily turn out to be the main villain, even though she kind of was the villain. Um, yeah, was, and, and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, you know, of course, we they had to have a villain, but... In, in some ways, in I this, don't even see it as a yeah. villain as much as an antagonist, yeah. mm -hmm. but it didn't exactly. fall into... It certainly didn't fall into the villain category that I think mm -hmm. a lot of people projected onto the series. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. Um, and of course, she did sing, mm -hmm. Catherine Hahn did sing the uh, the mm -hmm. her own theme song. Yeah. Uh, for and I love that this show has made her a star. I mean, she oh, yeah. she's a star. We've always point. known it. You know, she, we've always known <laughs> it. She's, she's unquestionably amazing. the breakout. And you know, one <laughs> thing I I absolutely love about where the Marvel Cinematic Universe is is you never know when these breakout characters are going to happen. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I love as weird as it is. I love the effect on comic book back issues you know where mm -hmm. you know you, you gotta be kidding me like you know people are paying this much for the first appearances of agatha harkness now the latest one is werewolf yeah. by night number three because that's the first dark hold mm. um oh really oh right yeah. right right yeah. yeah so it's it's crazy oh. uh, i love <laughs> that i love that how turbulent that is it's uh, that's a fun ride for, for me to observe is mm -hmm. from the background definitely I'm not going to shout out that money, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be uh, a, lot anyway. and... <laughs> yeah, a yeah. lot already anyway. Yeah. Um, um, but it's just, you know, th this was such a great, uh, a great series because yeah. it played fast and loose uh, with, you know, actual canon comic book canon. Mm -hmm. So there was enough clues. There was enough breadcrumbs there to string people who were huge comic fans who knew the history of these characters mm -hmm. and knew the storylines and all that to kind of to, to follow and of course throw up any kind of crazy fan theory that could all potentially work or not work. Mm -hmm. um, but then also people who only knew the movies uh, mm -hmm. or only knew the TV series could actually also still really enjoy and speculate as much as they, uh, as they desired, um, which did have, in a, in a way, had had some uh, negative effects. The amount of speculation there, yeah, uh, for some stupid reason. But people are always gonna, you know, get pissed off if exactly yeah. what they wanted to happen didn't happen. But that's not the point. 
all this had yeah. already been made. The fan, the writers were not doing this to answer your your fan theories. They were there to tell an amazing story, and I think. But at they, the same token, that. I also think that's testimony to how passionate some people mm -hmm. get over this. Yeah. Um, you just have to be realistic about your expectations. <laughs> it's a nine is, you know, this is not, this is not going to be the yeah. bridge from the Mar. You know, this isn't going to be what connects the Marvel cinematic universe with the star Wars universe. You know, she wasn't <laughs> wielding the force, you know, please. <laughs> oh, they're, and, they're out there, baby. <laughs> they're, they're well, there. It, but to, to that point too, I mean, they even uh, Marvel themselves also gave a huge, massive wink and nod to expanding it into another acquired universe of characters that uh, they just got from Fox the other year by having, um, you know, the Fox's X-Men version of Quicksilver make an appearance, which, of course, you know, ended up being kind of a bait and switch and, which. you know, kind of a goof anyway. But the fact that that happened, I don't know about you guys, but like when oh my he God. showed up at the door, I think my mouth fell like off of my <laughs> face, fringe first episode, blah, you know, like whatever, just freaking out mm -hmm. um, off the couch, just uh, floored. My exact um, post was they went there and then they went there. Yes. Uh, and it really, <laughs> I don't think you're going to top anything for me in the last you know in, in the next few mm. years to really occupy the shock that mm -hmm. that episode had i mean it was it, and it was just so beautifully handled too oh yeah you know yeah it was, it was just know, so. it was fun there was no you didn't know that it was necessarily coming you knew something was coming but you didn't know that that was coming, that was coming and i think yeah. that that really that was really great but yeah. you know again Marvel does this almost every time they have a movie. There's something that's a shock and that's not mm -hmm. expected. And the next series, which starts next week, uh, the 19th. Uh, no, tomorrow. No, next week. No. Yeah, the 19th. Next week. Okay. Yeah. Next week, the 19th. Um, Falcon Winter Soldier. I mean, Who knows? Maybe there might be something wild and crazy that pops up in that. <laughs> And then, of course, Loki's coming later this year, and yeah. you know that's just going to be batshit and <laughs> wild, and yeah. they'll throw so much stuff in there. For, okay, um, we've been up, and let's hear from John what he thought. Oh, about. yeah, man. Yeah, 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 sorry. WandaVision <laughs> as a whole, man, I, again, I read for, I love that continuity, and when we finally get a Marvel TV show that says it's going to matter and it's going to pertain to the movie's shield, which S.H.I.E.L.D. didn't. Um, and uh, WandaVision actually delivers on that. So these flashbacks, we're using actual footage with the same people, with expanding on their backstories. I mean, my heart was just like, oh, you know, like I was so happy the whole time. Um, I think that mechanically, you had made a comment about, you know, this could be a movie. And I kind of sit back, though, and I kind of think about that, like, mechanically, what does that look like on the big screen? So is mm. it the please stand by and then we start with the next segment, the different era? You know what I mean? Like, what does that look like if it's a movie, I guess? Um, and then, of course, you know, with the credit scenes and stuff like that. But I just mm -hmm. kind of was like, I, I love that it was framed as a TV show and it was a TV show. And they brought that credit. They brought that story. Mm -hmm. um, things, little details here and there. First of all, the kiddos uh, just were just well cast. I love that yeah. so much. Um, and then I love little nods to the old movies. So like in the final episode where Wanda appears behind Agatha and does that trippy walk thing that where she like blinks out or it like speeds her up or whatever. And then she does the the spell that make that took them to the scene at the post. Yeah. But how she moves yeah. like all jagged. That's exactly yeah. how it was in, you know, Age of Ultron. Um, and I just thought that was such a fun nod back to her old power set, you know. Um, <laughs> but it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of old, a lot of new um mm -hmm. vision really shined for me as well it's really fun to get to know that character because i didn't really get as much of that from the movies i felt like i wanted more of him in the movies and so this was that real good opportunity to just kind of sit back and take in the character with some additional flashbacks surrounding the movies so it's just like a bunch of extra bonus content for me and i absolutely yeah. adored it. i thought it was great that, that's a good point i mean these are two characters that although they were you know featured players yeah uh you know in in the movie since age of ultron they really haven't had a chance to shine i mean they had moments in mm -hmm. infinity war um you know but then 
Vision dies at the end of Infinity War, and Scarlet Witch is blipped. So there's yeah. uh, nothing happens until Scarlet Witch shows up at, towards the end of the uh, of the last movie. Um, but even then, um, you know, she has some like really powerful things, but there's no character development. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. They they kind of gloss over almost her her grief, and that was this yep. show. Like, the show yeah. gave not just her backstory, her origin, but also like. Well, what happens? She just lost yeah. the love of her life. But, and, you know, uh, at, at the same yeah. token, with films like that, you know, there's mm -hmm. only so much bandwidth that you can dedicate. It was already three think, hours. <laughs> and I think this this type of setup where I don't want to say non-marquee characters, but characters that may you may not think automatically would headline a film, mm -hmm. get their day in the sun and benefit from it i think even more than the films than they would in films because of the extended nature of the the stream you know of where we are with streaming and series nowadays yeah yeah, um, yeah. so smart though and i guarantee you now when i watch endgame and thanos is like i don't even know who you are i'm gonna yell i know who she is get with it thanos get your disney plus Watch it. <laughs> it's it. free with Verizon. Just get yeah. a limited plan. I mean, you can get it straight to your ship or whatever. Relax. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say some things I didn't like about the series now, if yep. that's okay. There's very few. I'm just gonna put you on mute. Is that okay? Um, <laughs> I did think I'm that, especially in the especially in the early episodes, that Elizabeth Olsen was far better suited for the material than Paul Bettany was. Um, by the end of the series, I, I liked where it went. I also loved the development with White Vision. That was one of my favorite developments in West Coast Avengers in the late '80s, where uh, you know the Vision literally had a reboot, and where that character goes from here, I think is you know it could be Vision Wanda. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, there's something there. Um, the uh, secondary baddie sword dude, you know, it, that was by the numbers. I thought there could have been a bit more nuance to his machinations. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, the other thing, too, I was thinking about was just that real, just that sick visual um, where – it's the two of them and it's got like the yellow and the red. So like the yellow is going to him, the red's coming from her. And I just thought that was just so freaking cool and powerful. Like just seeing how she made him um, or emulated him or whatever. And uh, I just, I can't get that scene out of my mind. Like when they first said, we're doing a show about this. I literally sat back like, what in the world? <laughs> you know, like how are we going to pull this one off? You know? And then the more I learned about it, I'm like, Ooh, I want to watch that. Um, yeah. And so that scene really kind of was, holistically what the series was for me was just seeing these two characters come together to weave a really cool story. Um, and, and actually James kind of hits a nail on the head here. WandaVision <laughs> didn't fulfill fans expectations. The expectations were crickets. I, and I'm, you know, I can fill in what I had for expectations for this um, because there were bits and, you know, bits and pieces that were, that were being sort of released before the show came out that it was going to be like a romp through television history. And it's like, Oh, it's all going to be kind of trippy and whatever. And eventually they're going to break free. I mean, I knew that the television tropes, like the television show tropes were coming, but not how it was being framed. Uh, when it switched gears in, I think it was the fourth episode where all of a sudden we see what's happening outside the hex. We see everything else with sword and we see Monica and we see Jimmy and we see, you know, everything that's happening outside of Wanda's, you know, Wanda's world. Um, that's where I think it, it shifted so much for me. I was like, this is not what I was expecting. Like I did not see it going in this direction. And then, you know, of course, everything kind of ties together and starts intermixing and um, you get what you get. And it was it, to me, it was it was amazing. And yeah, I mean, there are some bits and pieces here and there that may have been kind of like, eh, they could have done that a little bit. But, you know, what? it was it was gorgeous. Yep. All right. You know, I'm, I'm impatiently waiting for, though, is like Disney to reach out and say, comic book bears, a comic book. Look, we need some extras. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do it. We're, we're looking at for bearded podcasters. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm in New Jersey. You know, yeah. I could very well be a Westview resident. 
uh, but um, but yeah, I mean that that was such an incredible show from Marvel. But what about a new show from DC? Well, we had a bunch over the last yeah. few weeks. <laughs> uh, we had a bunch. I think the first one to hit. Uh, I'm not exactly sure on the dates, but I think the first one to hit was on Epics, which was the second mm-hmm. season of Pennyworth. Mm-hmm. I know you haven't watched it yet, Steve, but you know how batshit crazy season one was. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> season two so far has been season one, hold my beer. Uh, oh, you know, God. And again, just for people who aren't aware, it's in this highly fictitious version of the 60s in, uh, in England. Uh, the country is basically split apart in civil war in the second season i don't think that's a big spoiler you've probably seen some stuff of that uh and we see alfred pennyworth in his post army career uh trying to make the best of things and in doing so he encounters people like uh, thomas and martha wayne in very different versions of thomas and martha wayne than i think anyone has been used to and uh it's it's batshit crazy it's you know it just takes every sort of Every sort of turn you can think of, it does. Um, just in this last week, uh, episode five of this season, uh, Alfie Pennyworth makes enough bad decisions for two seasons for <laughs> in, in the space of one episode. Um, so I'm not even going to describe it. Maybe once, uh, Steve, because I know you're eventually going to get to it. Maybe mm-hmm. we can talk about that then. Uh, I think the next one that came through was Black Lightning in its uh, fourth and final season. Uh, it's been relentlessly depressing <laughs> by my estimation. Uh, yeah. You know, after the Markovian War in um, Freeland, uh, uh, this week had a, a development that I think was almost on par with what we talked about with Pietro. So mm-hmm. again, Steve, once you see that, just be prepared for a really big shock. Um <laughs> And that just hit this weekend. Uh, but, you know, everybody's acting incomprehensibly. And, you know, it probably is time to wrap the show in a bow. Cress Williams is the absolute worst actor I've ever seen acting drunk. Uh, I, mean, oh. it's, it's, it's I was going to say, like, no, do. he's got a really great emotional resonance. And you're, like, acting drunk. And I'm no. like, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's the pits. It's the pits. Uh, and then with, also with CW, we've had The Flash. Mm-hmm. Um, which uh, though it is, it's, uh, what, sh- what season is it in sixth, seventh, seventh season, seventh, seventh season. season. They're basically for the first, uh, at least four episodes, they're going through the scripts that, um, they weren't able to film. So it really does feel mm-hmm. like 6.5. Um, yeah. And, uh, that's all I'll say about Bat that. Woman. Don't and about and then Batwoman. Batwoman. Now I know you've watched some, so this is mm-hmm. more I can throw this at you. So why don't you tell us about some of the, the uh, developments in Batwoman season two? Well, jo- uh, John, I think are you you're caught up with Batwoman as well? I am on episode. I just finished episode four last night. So. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. So you're most you're mostly caught up. So yeah, yeah I mean Batwoman. Uh, obviously, we have a new actress stepping into the role, and not just a new actress, but a completely new character. Uh, Javisha Leslie came in to. Uh, to play Ryan, who essentially kind of falls into the role of Batwoman. She, you know, she discovers the Batcave. She, you know, discovers her, you know, the, uh, uh, the Batwoman equivalent of the Scooby gang and very quickly integrates or become in, becomes part of like the gang. Um, she's now working, uh, at the bar. She's, you know, she's trying very hard to, uh, um, to to investigate, uh, you know, what happened to Kate Kane, you know, because everybody still thinks she's alive. And of course, Alice continues her batshit like complete other, like her I, her story. I don't know. Like every time there's there's like some development with her, it's like it just goes off the rails. And then she's got another character development, and you're like, oh, so she's had her memory erased. She was on this island in the oh, middle no. of like where and she was in love with this guy named ocean because i guess stream was taken you know like just just all sorts of wildness uh now we've got a an art thief spider-man um who's also a very like proud a uh, proud gay out character and you know just sort of all sorts of wildness that that happens in the show and i love it i you know i really enjoy it i think 
Um, Javisha Leslie's getting more comfortable with the role. Because I think at first, the first couple episodes, not just her character, Ryan, but then also I think she was still trying to feel out this role and like the physicality of it and, you know, her delivery. Um, Cause it's, it's tough to act in that big hard rubber suit sometimes and doesn't always come off great. But I agree. I actually, to be honest with you, I actually like the season way better than season one. So mm-hmm. yeah. mm-hmm. Kane is a cool character in the comics, but and yeah. Ruby Rose, nothing on her at all. It just, the chemistry just wasn't there. Like something was yeah. off for me. So she was, I was like, so wooden. Uh, yeah, I just yeah. I wasn't feeling it at all. Um, I, I'll, I'll say, you know, Alice as a character doesn't do it for me either. I'll be honest with you. I kind of <laughs> wish she would go away. Um, but I am going to say this new Batwoman is out freaking standing. I love the messaging. Mm-hmm. I think about, yeah. you know, younger viewers that tune in and see, oh, there's someone different, you know, that can be a superhero too. And I just think that's so powerful and so cool. Um, mm-hmm. So I actually really, really appreciate that. Uh, the show is very progressive. And I just, I love that too. I think that it's fun to show you know, just a different uh, side of the DCU. Um, and I hope that other people are enjoying it as much as I am. I love the lead, though. I think she's wonderful. Um, yeah. And especially when she ditched the red wig. I mean, the red wig's iconic, but I love just seeing her do her. Like, I think it's so cool. So, I don't know. That's hey, just... there's, there's, some red t- there's some red tint when she, you know, when she's in action, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I totally agree about the wig yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, seeing her take over the lead of the show, not the lead role with the lead of the show. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, as I said, I wouldn't have necessarily tagged wooden on Ruby Rose, but now that I see her and see how vibrant uh, mm-hmm. the nature of a Batwoman character can be, I definitely mm-hmm. feel that way. Mm-hmm. The last season moved along at a molasses pace. This yeah, one's going yeah. a bit too fast. Um, I think there's too many plot lines. Uh, crisscrossing with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, yeah. And I will agree with you with Alice. I do think they should have been more judicious with using her, um, you know, which might've been tough, you know, engaging an actress on a recurring basis instead of a, instead of a series regular, I can understand the politics of that, but um, it seems that when she does appear, it should mean more instead of the new Alice development of the week. Um, yeah. You know, so there and the the problems I had with certain cast members last year continue. Um, yeah. I don't mm-hmm. think it's an exceptionally well cast show in in regards to two particular actors, uh, yeah. but it's it's a different show, and I'm glad it is. And uh, I'm hoping that they can iron out the kinks because I do think there's a really potent show uh, that's underneath. Yeah. And, and I hope mm-hmm. to get to that. I also like it for the same reasons that you talk about, John. You know that we, you know that we have um, not just the LGBTQ angle and some of the and some of the other issues, but now we have this uh, this added con- this added conceit of race and of income inequality mm-hmm. uh, that I think is very important. Spe- and in Gotham yeah. is a great backdrop for that too. Yeah. So. Um, I, I'm I'm optimistic about where the show goes. I don't give a shit about the crows. I wish they would. Mm-hmm. You know, just it, it's it's not working. Yeah. You know, it's it's not working. Um, you know, there are some failures there, but uh, yeah. there's uh, there's a lot of good there, and I just think there's a really good show that's under the surface that I hope gets to the surface. Mm-hmm. Yep. You you know what crows I really enjoy, the kind that are on another DC show. That are the uh, school mascots for uh, <laughs> high school uh, in Kansas. And what show would that be, Bill? That would be that a show I'm called Superman. Superman and Lois, or as you keep calling it, Lois and Clark. Um, Lois and Clark. <laughs> or uh, Superman and Lois and Jared and Jonathan. <laughs> so uh, I guess I'll give the rundown on that. Uh, Superman and Lois is a new series based uh, you know, on the Superman character. We have Tyler Hecklin. In the lead is Clark and Superman and Elizabeth Tullock, which I believe that's a pronou- the correct pronunciation uh, as Lois. Mm-hmm. And they have two teenage sons. And I love this show so far. Mm-hmm. I absolutely love this show. Uh, where we are with Superman right now is he has lost his job. Clark has at the Daily Planet. 
and his mother has recently passed away. So they decide to move to Smallville. They do have two teenage sons, uh, John, which is a familiar name if you're there with the comic book. And oh my God, it's, uh, it's passing me the other kid. Jordan. Jared. Jordan. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Jordan. Um, and uh, the twins are very different. Uh, I think of I think of one of my friends who literally has the che- the cheerleader and the goth uh, as children, and there's 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 some of that, but they're not that one dimensional. And uh, in moving back to Smallville and starting new lives for four you know for four family members, um, f- for me, and I hope you guys agree with me on that what the vibe that man of steel tried to accomplish in the smallville sequences and failed this accomplished within 30 seconds Mm -hmm. um and um i'm very impressed with tyler hecklin uh Mm -hmm. i love that we have a superman who is flawed who is failing as a father in certain ways uh, of, of course, some of that is due to his responsibilities, but you get to the nature of the character. And this is, you know, this is how I've always seen Superman. He's the best person in the world. You know, there's a great old Silver Age story where it didn't matter what planet uh, kal landed on. He would have been a hero on that planet. He's just, mm-hmm. an, um, you know, whether it was, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> what was in... <clears throat> from the genes of uh, Jor-El and Lara or the lessons from uh, Jonathan and Martha, he's he, he's an intensely good person. And mm-hmm. why does a work email have to come in now? Okay, sorry <laughs> about that. And uh, though he is that type of person, he is a liar. And, mm-hmm. uh, and this show has found a way of really dealing with that um in what i think is i hate to use this word but a realistic manner uh mm. i'm not as sold on on uh to look as elizabeth as as lois but uh even i will admit that her chemistry with tyler is dynamite they mm. really feel to me like they've been a couple for 15 years yeah. um and the show has gone to some places that i think are kind of brave you know um not just Jordan, but another character, you know, are, are dealing with mental health issues. And mm-hmm. especially for a network that is, you know, however you look at it, somewhat teen centric, yeah. you know, that's an important story to tell. Um, mm-hmm. And to have that, that representation on screen as well. Um, uh, there's a subplot with uh, Luther that's not a Luther that we're used to. Uh, there's some other subplots with the, uh, Low, and I do. I also did like that Sam Lane wasn't one note. You know, very mm-hmm. often the general Sam Lane depiction is like Superman bad, and that's it. This is something totally different. Uh, I, I'm just, I've just been blown away by the show every week. Yeah, and uh, I'm so glad yeah. it's there. Very, very emotional. Um, some great emotional beats. I mean, there were some teary eyed moments. There were some, uh, you know, just some really great dialogue. Uh, Mm -hmm. between the boys and Clark and Lois and Clark. And, um, (laughs) you know, I, I'm really enjoying actually some of the, some of the side characters like, uh, you know, Lana, when she first popped in, you know, the, the actress playing Lana, I was just sort of like, Oh, this, this sounds like it's going to be kind of like a weird side character. We're not really Mm going to care too much about, but, the cracks are starting to show and I really, you know, in season or in episode three, I think you get to see a little bit more of, you know, what's happening with the paint peeling off of her marriage and the, you know, her home life and her children and her relationship there, you know, what she's trying to, you know, sort of present to the town. Mm -hmm. Um, But one of the things that you didn't mention is that I like how they're depicting this small town, uh, you know, and there's, uh, you know, obviously a lot of, small towns in the center of the country that are very similar to this um, where, you know, they used to be a lot of industry. There used to be a lot of stuff going on, but now, you know, that's kind of dying. People are leaving uh, and there's not much there. So, you know, one of the big subplots is of course uh, Morgan edge and his company are coming in 
to provide jobs, but in doing so, obviously exploiting, you know, a population that's already depressed that needs work and is willing to work for whatever amount of money um, that he's willing to throw at them or, you know, probably kryptonite experiments or whatever kind of craziness is going to happen here because, you know, it is still a superhero show. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really like seeing that aspect um, that, you know, these four people, three people really, I mean, Clark did grow up there, but, you know, Lois and the boys, they're not used to seeing this. They're not, they're coming from a big city where everything is like one, you know, really big thing. And here, the small town, their feelings and these people matter a lot. <laughs> and um, you get to see that. You get to see, you know, the emotional aspect of something, not just a parody of a small town. Even the old Smallville series, which I love, it holds a big place <laughs> in my heart, didn't really get small town living all that well because, uh, man, everybody was like really well put together and had tons of money for the latest fashions. And, you know, like it's just not really. <laughs> Yeah, really you know the biggest problem for me life. with Smallville was it had so much CW itis. You know, yeah. you know it was mandatory. It was every, Hill, but with like yeah. Superman. It was <laughs> mandatory every third episode. Someone had to say, "I thought you were my friend." You know, I mean the the you know the records <laughs> of the Kents and Lana at Smallville General Hospital. My God, they must fill rooms. You know, I mean, they, you know, there was there was that, and you know, that whole thing. Like, I'm 23, and I'm the CEO of a of a major global network. You know, that kind of nonsense. Um, Smallville had a lot of CW itis. The Flash does too, a little bit. The Flash yeah. still does too, a little bit. Um, but uh, why'd you but, keep this from me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thought you were my friend. I thought you were my friend. friend. <laughs> Um, I would say yeah, it will be at the end of the episode. Yeah, all right. Yeah. I, I would say towards uh, Lois and Clark. First of all, I the, not watching the show is all is your guys' fault. Just putting that out there. So <laughs> follow, follow sorry, me, all on you. I absolutely. First of all, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. So I've got the first two episodes done, and boy, that first episode has a lot to unpack. Right when you're thinking about those previous Superman iterations, movies, shows, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, first of all. That actor got so much flack when he first came on Supergirl. So do you guys remember yeah. that? That's not Superman. He looks way too like unhappy. Too short. Yeah. Whatever. He's this. He's that. Too I don't short, know about you guys, but when he's up in the sky flying in his outfit, it gets a little toasty. Yeah. And a little bit mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and on, on top of that, if you see him in other movies, like him in uh, Every Everybody Wants Some, right. he's mm -hmm. a very good actor. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. He, he is he is all over the map of what he can do. Yeah. So impressive. I, I mean, I lusted after him when I first saw him in Teen Wolf. So, <laughs> so I just, you know, it's, it's past, you know, totally just it. He really is putting on a good Superman. I love uh, that you guys called out the humanity aspect of it. This is one mm -hmm. reason why I don't read a lot of Superman literature is because it's boring to me. I don't identify with it. Um, this character that interests me seeing him have struggles at home, struggles at work changing it up where they're living caring for his family that is exciting to me because that's a character that actually speaks to me a little bit someone that's perfect and untouchable i, I just don't get into that um and so i i freaking love 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 this series because i think it's going to bring a lot of people into the character and a lot of people into dc um and you know that maybe wouldn't have previously so that is exciting to me um the mental health thing was another thing that jumped out at me. So mm. a lot of CW shows really uh, pride themselves on, you know, a lot of that romance between characters. I actually don't get a lot of those vibes from these two episodes that I've seen so far. Mm. Like, sure, there's some puppy love with the kids or whatever. But this is, like, legit, like, family. Lois is here to rock it. Um, and can we just give a nod to Lois's resignation letter? Hello? <laughs> <laughs> like, that was this is the best piece of writing I've done since you started, said, you know, since you bought this place. Yeah. 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 And that was before I saw what she wrote, the way she walked in there like a boss and just, mm -hmm. just boom. And I just said, Atta girl, that's awesome. So that was cool. Um, seeing her, her courage that her character portrayed when she went to the town hall meeting was another light bulb moment for me of, I freaking love this character. I almost dropped the F-bomb, mm -hmm. sorry. Guys. But um, I, um, I'm just, I'm so on fire about it. So yes, I'm going to continue watching it because it's freaking awesome. Um, and then finally, the one character I want to punch in the face means this guy is doing his acting great. 
Lana's husband just mm. screams like, oh, yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, "I'm a jerk store. I'm a, I don't know, you know, <laughs> like I just, I'm a tool bag or whatever." So check this out, right? We're painting this picture of our town is not well off, right? But hey, come over to my place, check out my three shelf grill where I'm handing out whole <laughs> racks of ribs. <laughs> I thought the conception of that character, that was the most brilliant way of, of saying I'm a Trumper without ever going there. <laughs> you know? It was great. It was yeah. great. And, I, you know, and, you know, plus the complication, you know, even that guy isn't one level. You know, yeah. even that guy has, you know, there, there are legitimate arguments to say, mm -hmm. I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, uh, yeah, you, you're gonna get fucked, but you know, I, I, I do see where you're coming from. Yeah. It, that that is actually that's something that I like. I mean, here's a here's a he's a he's a villain. He's like a non-powered, you know, simple small town villain. But he's not just simple. I mean, there's some there's a lot of truth to him and truth to his perspective that he's saying, and that you know his arguments that he's making are the same arguments that are being made every single day when you watch the news when you you know when you hear some of the people who end up showing up in congress like i mean those are the same arguments that they're making yeah. um and to him it makes sense to yeah. do that given his you know what's happening in smallville so yeah no i i, I think also there's so on the third episode an amazing fight sequence in oh, the middle god, of yeah. all this my god oh. that was one of the best fight sequences i've ever seen on a superhero show that, oh, that hotel, that motel sequence, and John, you're gonna love it. If you haven't seen it yet, you're going to love it. You're gonna love it. You're gonna, you're love, gonna it. love it. Okay, so cool. Because <laughs> you're gonna be like, you know, the, you know. I remember with Superman Returns, could he throw like one punch? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get it here. You know, for people that are jonesing for that boy, you're gonna get that. So, okay, okay, really, really well done show. Um, yes. I think the only one we haven't, though, I think we talked about them all. Um, Riverdale. Yeah. I don't know. I still R Riverdale, watch it. I mean. Had a seven-year time, time jump. Yeah. And Betty's, just, Betty's like, in the FBI just now. like that woman, way too many plot lines going on at once. Yeah. Way I, too yeah. I think that's always been Riverdale. Yeah. I've only seen so season good. one, and I absolutely loved it. But the main moral of the story, guys, I got from it, aside from how awesome it was, was I really want Jughead's hat. Like I want that beanie so bad, so I might have to Google for that. Well, because I by, a lot of that. by season seven, you have a beanie list jughead. No. Yeah. Yeah. Unacceptable. That hat is so legendary. Like, oh man, I'm gonna find one. <laughs> for so. All right. The name of the show is Comic Book Bears, so we do need to talk about some actual comic books. Uh, I'm gonna start as I always do with Steve. Uh, and we seem to have fallen into certain roles this week. Uh, I'll be doing DC books. John will be doing Marvel books. And Indie Steve will be setting it off right now. So, Steve, why don't you tell us about a book that you're reading that you're digging? So, uh, John alluded to it earlier, but um, Vault has been putting out some fantastic horror themed comics or darker you know darker themed comics and one of the more recent ones this one came out uh last month was issue number one this is issue number two uh is the picture of everything else it's very different from a lot of their other uh the the other works that they're putting out this is um written by dan waters with art and colors by kishori mohan and basically it's a period piece it takes place in paris uh, in the 1800s, about, um, gosh, I'm trying to think, like, or maybe the early 1900s, it's, it's kind of around there. Um, you actually have a young Picasso kind of makes his appearance in this issue, which is very interesting. But it, it's, uh, at its heart, it is an art piece. It is a critique about art. Um, the main character himself is an artist uh, who has some tragedy that happens to him. Um, and a lot of it, of course, is the supernatural aspect of it. Uh, he witnesses something uh, very horrific and very much a kind of uh, almost Lovecraftian situation uh, involving another artist, an English artist, uh, who has the ability to basically draw death. Uh, you know, the subjects of his paintings, um, he can destroy whatever way he wants he just paints them and paints their death and 
I mean, as ridiculous and horrific as you can think of, you know, he can slice the canvas and their head flies off or <laughs> he sets it on fire and wherever they are, they just completely are immolated. Um, but uh, that was the first issue. Now, by the second issue, he is stopped painting completely and he's just sort of thrown himself into the Parisian art critique scene. He's now an art critic. He cannot paint it. You know, his it fills his head with like migraines and fear and because he knows what he's seen and he doesn't want any part of that. His lover, on the other hand, uh, it has gone off to become the apprentice uh, to this evil artist. Um, and, uh, you know, he encounters him a little bit later on in the salon and, uh, you know, his, his former partner is like, why don't you come to the dark side? Essentially, uh, my, you know, you just don't understand what he can do. He can remake reality. And of course, you know, what are you going to do? Our hero has to go and see what's, <laughs> see what's what in order to try and stop this, uh, this monster from enacting more evil. But uh, of course, it's never that simple. So pick up issue number two. And it's, it is a short series. I think it's only about five issues. But um, in two issues, there's a lot going on. And there's a lot to read, by the way. So be prepared uh, to bring your glasses on this one. You've got a lot to read and some beautiful art to look at. So uh, the picture of everything else by uh, Waters and uh, Mohan. And of course, it is out by Volt Comics. All right. Uh, let's move over to John. John, tell us about something you're reading that you're digging. All right. So something that I'm digging, but unfortunately, I've already hit rock bottom because the series is over three issues in, as I anticipated. It was advertised that way. But King and Black's offering of the limited series Thunderbolts. Um, Thunderbolts for me is very meaningful because um, Dark Avengers, uh, uh, ha kind of the Thunderbolts series in Dark Reign fed into the Dark Avengers. Um, and so I always have a soft place in my heart for villains trying to do good or pretend to do good for ominous reasons, whichever. Um, and so the Thunderbolts original lineup uh, with Kurt Busiek on the ones and twos was absolutely outstanding. I love that run. This was certainly not that. Um, it was a different creative team and different characters, but I'm like, I am in. Like, let's give it a shot. It's going to be just a small event tie-in kind of a thing. You got characters that I don't know anything about, like Mr. Fear and Valtrak. Never met them at all. But then you got a character like Star, who originated from the pages of Captain Marvel and had her own limited run recently. And I'm like, holy smokes, I'm glad I picked up that five issue mini run or what I think it was five issues. Um, and that was it was fun to get to know her. So I'm like familiar with her check. And then we got Taskmaster up in here. Total not a team player. So I'm like, this is going to be amazing. I'm all in. Like, let's see how this goes. Uh, one of my biggest regrets here um, was I was so excited about Wilson Fisk assembling this team and rhino was one of the team members i don't read a lot of spidey and so um rhino is you know just one of those core spider-man villains so i'm like cool i'll get to know him first issue ducks out of the team that's it like the non-committal spirit of thunderbolts and it's the funniest thing but i was so annoyed as a reader because i'm like i wanted to see him like i just wanted to read more and see the dialogue i know it's limited and it's like one-off kind of stuff the characters that did stick around, though, really delivered. It truly was a lot of fun. There was absolutely minimal loyalty to the team, to the team cause, to the contract with Wilson Fisk. I mean, it was just a lot of stuff that took me back to Dark Reign with the Dark Avengers of, why are we doing this exactly? Um, and so during during a time when we're over overrun with symbiotes, we still have time to pick on each other, to make fun of each other, uh, to call each other out on stupid stuff. It really was a quirky group of people that did not want to work together and i enjoyed every issue of it all three of them um and at the end of the issue um this was the moment i was hoping for so i'm dropping a big spoiler but at the end taskmaster and the team trick uh, wilson fist portraying that they all died when in fact they had it and they walk into his office and he's given this like you know testimony of how awesome they were and how heroic they were and they're like dude we're still alive um and then they're like also, we're just going to go find more work to do because we got, you know, we got we got work to do together. So it sounds like they want to stick together. So fingers crossed for an ongoing. Yeah. I'll, I will completely read it because, again, I don't know anything about Mr. Fear or, or Baltrock as characters. Star is really cool um, as a character. I'm really enjoying her. And then Taskmaster is one that, I mean, I'll, I'll, I want to get more and more familiar with him. But I suspect from what I've read of his limited runs where it's a solo run. 
that he really is a standalone work alone character like a death stroke right so seeing him in a team environment to me is really weird so i'll be open to seeing that though you know how it goes if they do it again but yeah definitely a lot of fun moments in here and it made it bearable it kind of was a bummer that it was tied in with the king in black event it could have been without it in my opinion um yeah and uh the other neat moment in here was they had to get two halves of the century the superman ripoff character in marvel he got torn in half by null so they went and found his legs somewhere and then they had to fish out his like torso from the river um and then like <laughs> wrapped him together and he was like a bomb for them or something uh with all of his power so it was the most ridiculous thing ever but they're just lugging this dead century around it was so great it was delightful so yeah <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun yeah it's so <laughs> random it's so weird but i was like yes <laughs> okay. okay uh i received my dcbs box on saturday so over the next few days i went through 37 dc books that were in there the majority of them were future state yeah. um <laughs> I already said La Bamba. I had, I had to do something else. But there was one Future State book I did really, really like. I liked Dark Detective, which was mm -hmm. the uh, Tamako uh, Batman, and she's going to be the regular writer on Detective. So uh, I'm encouraged by that. I'm also very encouraged by Philip Kennedy Johnson's writing on Superman House of L. Uh, this is a one shot that, and Steve, I know you're passing it. I know it's only about like 43 pages of story or so. Mm -hmm. Didn't it feel like you read a whole graphic novel? Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. really filled. It's filled with new characters where we are in future state and God forbid anybody, if they ever try to put a future state calendar together, cause nothing really fits, but <laughs> it, it's over. So we're good. Um, but yeah. we're in the future. We're on the moon. We're on earth's moon and it is inhabited. Uh, by a collection of Superman devotees. Some of them are from Earth. Some of them are from other planets. Uh, this one here, Theander, is half Thanagarian, half Earthling. Uh, there's also a Blue Lantern, and that makes a lot of sense since uh, since Blue was the color of hope, and that's something that's directly correlative to mm -hmm. Superman. Um, it's a very uh, basic story that happens. There is a character, the Red King, that is attacking various posts in in the future in the universe, and um, the Red King may or not may or may not be Orion, um, as uh, dictated by one of the other books in here. Um, uh, but it shows that the uh, legacy of Superman continues. We also have an a, a appearance at the end by a character which may or may not be John Kent, which ties into some other stories recently in the in the DC universe. Uh, you also have a, a very hot Silver Daddy version of, of who we think is Kal El, um, and yeah, oh Jesus! I mean, the, this scene where he's got his boot on the younger guy. Ah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the stuff Maybe I that's, be getting that. I don't know. That, that, that's the stuff we, you can get away with on this on the comic book beers podcast but um you know there certainly have been a lot of stories in the past like whether it was grant morrison superman beyond or uh, mm -hmm. the supremacy and supreme that alan moore wrote uh you know which is a superman analog you know we've had this collection and legacy of superman stories before um but I have to say, I am very excited now about Philip Kennedy Johnson having uh, control of this particular franchise because he certainly knows what makes that character tick. Uh, mm -hmm. And in some ways did that through an expression through other characters that was very interesting. Um, so if you can still find it, get it. Really liked it. Steve, you liked it too? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's a, it's a, you said, yeah, you know, the basic is the basic premise of it is, you know, they're protecting Earth or the, the city on the moon uh, as a last outpost before Earth from this mysterious Red King who's just sort of, you know, running roughshod through the galaxy. Yeah. Um, uh, we should mention it, their, their headquarters is the Fortress of Sanctuary. Yes. That's probably worth mentioning. Um, 
I forgot and it, to do. But it just kind of drops you in the middle middle of this this conflict. So it's you know it's been going on. Here's a whole bunch of characters. Some that you kind of recognize. Some that you're wondering how does this character like actually fit in somewhere. Uh, like Brendan. Um, you know, like who is Brendan? Where does Brendan come <laughs> from? And who did he hook up with? Which Thanagarian did he hook up with? Um, but uh, you know, there's there's some really interesting. Uh, information here and characters that they throw in Mm -hmm. um and they don't really need to do much introduction because they all are kind of in a way aspects of uh of clark kal al superman that we've kind of seen over the years um you know sort of personified in these in these other characters so um pretty cool and yeah uh johnson did a great job and i i think he's got a good uh, a good future with uh, with the Superman franchise. Yep. Okay, uh, Steve, let's go back to you there. Talk about another book that you're reading, digging from Indie World. Uh, so I've uh, you know, and I've talked about them before, but uh, AWA Artists with Attitude or whatever, um, AWA Studios has been putting out some amazing stuff. So I, you know, I've actually just been picking up everything that uh, that they have every month. So. Um, this is, uh, issue number one of Chariot that came out last week. Uh, I had no idea what this book was about before I picked it up. I was like, it's got AWA in the corner. I'll buy it. I don't know what it's about, what's going to happen with it. Uh, I had no expectations and, uh, honestly, I loved it. So for one thing, you can kind of tell sort of from, you know, if you want to judge your book by the cover, you've got, uh, brooding possible hero, fast, interesting car. Uh, sort of like, you know, a holographic, uh, you know, 80s chick. Basically, there you go. There's the book. Um, it is, uh, it's crazy. It's wacky. Uh, there's some really beautiful colors in here by Marco Lesko. Brian Edward Hill is the writer. Priscilla Petrades is the artist. But I mean, just some beautiful layouts. Um, the the basic story is there's uh, some, you know, uh, two-bit criminal who is trying to go straight and he's trying to take care of his, uh, his poor sick kid. Um, but unfortunately he still owes money to the worst of the worst. And so, you know, in order to try and keep his kid healthy, he decides to go and, uh, see if he can do some work for this you know minor crime boss. Uh, and in the meantime, he's also a car mechanic. He's been fixing up this interesting car that seemed to have fallen in his lap. That is unlike any kind of car that he's seen before. Um, and of course, while he's working on that, two bit criminal shows up and says, buddy, we're going to rough you up. I know you're going to do work for us. You still owe me money. We're just going to make you believe in the meantime, you still owe us the money afterwards. Uh, and the car comes to his rescue, like kit style, you know, Knight Rider. It's got a mind of its own. Something's going on with this. And lo and behold, uh, apparently, uh, there seems to be a ghost in the machine and it's a very, um, very sort of 80s interesting like dude what's going on um it's very cool i love it uh i think it's really great and what makes it even more fun and awa does this in the back of all of their number ones is they have sort of quick letters from the author and from the artist explaining why they like this um brian edward hill writes a single page so you're like okay you think it's cool thanks for buying the book awesome but uh priscilla Petrades, she throws it out there the aesthetic of this book is purely her, it feels like. Uh, she loved all those 80s action movies as a kid. And then, you know, as she got older, she incorporated a lot of anime and sort of like new Japanese sort of cyberpunk. And she threw it all together. And this is what you have for this this beautiful aesthetic. So um, really enjoyed it. Really great. Pick it up if you want to have fun with it. It's a five-issue series. Um, Chariot by AWA. I, I feel like Chariot's really given me, you know, Knight Rider is a great nod. Mm-hmm. I got to give it up the love bug, baby. Come on. <laughs> that, that, that Volkswagen just saved so many days. Like, that's where it's yeah. at. So. It's, it's, like, it's like Herbie, but if Herbie <laughs> were curvy... Yeah. ...had a holographic miniskirt, I think that's it. And, you know, and not to... Not to you know, give it the fan service, but it is just a beautiful design of a book yeah. and the characters are very well drawn. Um, you know, the, the main sort of big lug is uh, kind of woofy. He's got some hairy forearms that I enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Over, over to John. To you. <laughs> All right. I don't, 
don't know how I can follow Harry Forearms, so I'll do my best here. Um, also on the Marvel train, you guys, all aboard the X-Men train, but in a way different direction. Hellions issue number 10. Hellions is a big hell yeah. Um, so 10 issues deep. The fact that we've made it this far blows my mind. So yeah. um, first of all, the assortment of characters in this book is genius. And I say that about a lot of the X titles, but this one really means a lot to me. First of all, we got Grey Crow from the Marauders. So the original group of mutants that slaughtered the Morlocks under the, under the streets. And it was an X-Men all mutant event where Angel like lost his wings and all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And just seeing him as a standalone character now with a group of different people and getting to know him has been really meaningful. Empath from the original Hellion. So Emma Frost students who were all massacred originally <laughs> um, and getting to know him and how manipulative he is. Um, it's also it's also been an experience. Uh, Havok, so Cyclops's brother, is in this group, and they're expanding on how he kind of has. Uh, uh, he's just that second follow up brother. He's not Cyclops. He's not worth anything. You know that kind of stuff. He has a little bit of insecurity going on. They're really riding that out in this series, talking about his love with Madeline Pryor, the clone of Jean Grey. Um, so that's been really cool. Psylocke's in the mix as the team leader. Good luck with that. Um, and then Orphan, <laughs> Orphan Maker and Nanny are two characters I know absolutely nothing about. Uh, they are very quirky and weird. But the star of the show, of course, is Sassy Mr. Sinister. And you guys have probably heard me talk about him before, but I just can't get enough. Like, Bar Sinister on the Playmon Discord server where we're at. That's so great. Um, but just Mr. Sinister and this just really shines. This issue actually opens up with Arcade's a classic, you know, Marvel villain. He's got his big green bow tie on and makes dangerous environment so he's kidnapped everybody and he's got mr sinister strapped to a table and he's literally pulling his teeth out one at a time like it is brutal it is fierce and it's just such a dark side to the arcade character and i'm i'm, I'm living for it like i love it so much uh mr sinister is forced to make a deal with him because of this uh which has been very entertaining and it's very odd seeing mr sinister get bitch slapped around by a character like arcade usually that should be the other way around in my mind um, so it's it's very interesting how the tables turn. Um, ultimately, this book just continues to delight. I never know what I'm getting into with the next issue. Um, but for me, it's all about learning about more of the characters um, and seeing just how they adapt to these various scenarios. Um, I, I can't speak highly enough of it, but a lot of these X titles are really rocking my socks right now. So Hellions is definitely one of my gold medalists, though, for sure. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. The only book I've uh, stayed with was X Men. Mm -hmm. uh, I bailed on New Mutants about issue thirteen mm -hmm. or so. <laughs> uh, I am pre-ordering the first issue of X Corp. That seemed mm -hmm. pretty interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, what X books are you still with? All of them. All. Of them. <laughs> All of them. Uh, Still have all of them. I even picked up uh, Demon Days, the new Peach, <coughs> excuse me, new Peach Momoko book, yeah. uh, translated Ooh. from Japanese. Yep, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's really cool. Very, very manga uh, in its its style and composition. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Love. Yeah. Okay. Uh, switching over to the distinguished competition, I did want to spend some time talking about Infinite Frontier. Uh, which sets the stage for the next stage of the DC universe. And we all have copies here. Um, uh, much like uh, DC Rebirth in 2016, it basically is a jumping on point for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of new stories. A principal writer is Joshua Williamson uh, with James Tinian IV and Scott Snyder, basically putting it together, but a bunch of other uh, writers and artists uh, involved in the mix. Um, uh, we do have uh, the first sighting of the Bendis written Justice League in a short sequence that has um, uh, Superman Flash and Black Adam or Shazadam. Uh, as it is controversially known, <laughs> as you controversially know. But I should I should backtrack to say that the uh, core story uh, is involved. Is if you were reading the end of uh, uh, the, the Dark Knight's uh, speed, the, 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 death, the, metal. the, the, the death metal, death metal, uh, death metal, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, you know, Wonder Woman death has it. Wonder Woman has effectively attained godhood. Mm. 
and she is invited to become part of the quintessence with Shazam, High Father, Hera, Phantom Stranger, and who the hell else? Gantha. And Shazam, Shazam. Uh, no, Gantha, with- Gantha. Ganthet, you're right. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, I already said. Yeah, I got them all. Um, yeah, and uh, she questions whether she should be joining this group, and uh, to show her that uh, life is going on, the Spectre takes her through uh, the infant frontier of the newly birthed multiverse and where certain characters are. Uh, probably the most. Um, most focus and press uh, has been the story of Alan Scott, uh, where he mm-hmm. is coming out to his adult children, Jaden Obsidian. Mm-hmm. Um, got into it a little bit on Facebook today with somebody who just wasn't, didn't mean to offend, but was just inarticulate. And um, I have to say that bit really, really resonated with me. You know, um, I came out to myself at 27. I came out to other people at 30. I know what it's like to keep something bottled up, you know, for for a particular, um, for a particular time period in adulthood and to see some representation of that, especially in a familiar character, it it just meant a lot to me. And uh, I just thought those, those four pages were just so beautifully handled and, you know, whoever is going to be shepherding, uh, the the what I see, it has to be a justice society book in the in the mix. Um, I hope they do present something with as much um, care and sensitivity as you saw on those pages. I, I just thought it was a beautiful sequence. Um, it was interesting with the Batman story, uh, which does pop up in three different places in the mm-hmm. in the book. Uh, the event is will become to known as a day. Uh, where there is a gas attack, a variation of the uh, Joker gas, and apparently kills a major villain, maybe. He looked kind of fucked up, so I wouldn't be surprised (laughs) if that's a bait and switch. But the most interesting thing about that is that is a major plot point in both the next issues of Batman and the first issue of the new Suicide Squad. Major plot mm-hmm. point. So uh, I think you will need this to get that because there wasn't even much of a recap. It was just uh, the references are, and actually some action happening contemporaneously with that in the turn in, in regards to Suicide Squad. Uh, we also have glimpses of uh, <clears throat> what's going on with the uh, Yara Floor Wonder Girl and um, who will be ascending to the to the role of Wonder Woman? Uh, we do have the first glimpse of Teen Titans Academy. Uh, we have some goings on with uh, John Kent in terms of the Superman world, and again, that is written by uh, Philip Kennedy Johnson. Uh, we do have an interesting interlude with Green Arrow and Black Canary, which presents the return of a particular character that was previously dead but it now apparently is alive. And again, uh, that was addressed in, uh, in death metal, um, that that is part of the rebirth of the multiverse. Uh, we have the first, and this is, this is amazing to think, um, th- the first star girl pages written by Jeff Johns in over 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's going to have a special, uh, and that also reintroduces one of my favorite, teams of the past in what we assume is the seven soldiers of victory uh we have the glimpse of the new green lanterns we also see barry allen passing the mantle of the flash once again to wally uh because Mm -hmm. because the flash will be uh, assisting uh with uh, some of the other characters that are essentially in a monitoring position of what this new universe and this new infant frontier uh and then we have what I really hope are some comic book deaths at the end. So, <laughs> um, uh, and the reintroduction, the reintroduction just from a few weeks ago with uh, <laughs> Justice League uh, Odyssey, but the reintroduction of a very big bad. So, um, as a jumping on point, you know, I'm, I'm certain there are people that would still be scratching their heads in regards to who this is, but I thought it was very effective. Yeah. I go. love that splash page. That mm-hmm. sort of like mm-hmm. let's 
let's get a poster of this because uh, mm. that's just a really cool way to. Uh, just a tie-in. Um, I don't have this week's books yet, but I did ha- did get the last week's books. And again, um, under the Infinite Frontier banner, you did have, excuse me, Batman, Suicide Squad, and Swamp Thing, and I thoroughly mm-hmm. enjoyed all of them. So, excellent, especially. After that terrible taste in my mouth from Future State, uh, I'm, I'm very excited about where things are going. So uh, Future State, is it uh, better or worse than you say, would you say, of uh, you know, New 52 World's End? Oh, New 52 World's End was like, that was so sad it was funny. Um, <laughs> it, it, just, it just got ridiculous. Uh, it just got so ridiculous. Everybody's that's, a brother. I wor- like you world, know, world's end is kind that that series is kind of in its own world. No pun intended. <laughs> I mean, that, that was just relentlessly depressing. Oh, uh, yeah, it, it was just you know, these how can any can't you give any of these people a break for like one day? You know, even the when they, even when they land on, on the you know, even where they effectively land where they are. There's instant betrayals, and you know it's a it's a manufactured. I, I, oh, you, ooh, bad bad memories. Um, yeah, yeah. Future State was just the the thing with me with Future State. If this was the direction that ooh. editorial thought people wanted, brother, you just were not on the mark at all. And I'm so ooh. glad that didn't happen. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so what do what do you think about Infinite Frontier? With Infinite Frontier, for me, I actually got to give it up to my boy Jay Crane for that hat. I mean, come <laughs> on, that hat though. So I, I'll be honest with you, I got Batman 106 again somewhere in my mountains here. Oh, there it is, um, Batman 106, and I saw on this cover, and I love this cover by the way, the simple yellow with them with the beautiful cosmic colors in the middle. <sighs> But then I'm looking closer. I'm like, what is that hat? Then I read Infinite Infinite Frontier, and I'm just like, oh, okay, I'm good. Um, exactly. So, so you know, <laughs> this this issue to me, I kind of got done with it, and I, I thought to myself, it is really it is selling everything that's coming up, but they did it in a way that was intelligent to me as a reader, and I actually really enjoyed it, like getting to see the whole uh, catalog. Uh, Star Girl, I share that excitement. Um, I love the show. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. And so getting to see nods to it in the books here, I'm like, yes, like that was a really fun one. I'm looking forward to seeing where we're going. Now, I'm not Bill. I'm not familiar with the character that came out. So can you kind of enlighten me and maybe other viewers a little bit? I might be the only one actually. I don't know, but I'm just not familiar with that character at all because I don't. I haven't read a lot of DC. Um, so the gentleman that came out, how you know what was he like? I guess in previous issues, um, you know, I just I don't know the character at all. So. Which, which character was this? The uh, character Scott. that came out to his kids. Oh, Alan Scott. Okay, so yeah. Alan Scott is the original Green Lantern. Uh, okay. We're talking 1940. Made his okay. first appearance way back in All American Comics. Okay. Um, when they did meld the universes, they tried to make some explanation about why this dude has a Green Lantern when there's a so Green Lantern Corps that he's not connected with, and it's mm. never really worked. Um, mm. So you just accept he's the Green Lantern before there was a Green Lantern. Okay. What you really know is Green Lantern. Okay. Um, for um, the majority of his uh, his time, he was depicted as a straight man, um, mm-hmm. had children he wasn't aware of uh, mm-hmm. fr- from a, a former wife who was also a super villain, then hero, and then sort of villain again, uh, named Harlequin. And um, has he's had his life extended through various means. Um, you know, one was through Valhalla, you know, the, through the, the fights at Ragnarok. Then he became young again. Uh, also, the since the ring is based on magic, he is a magic character. Mm-hmm. And for a time was becoming a character named Sentinel so mm-hmm. that he, you didn't confuse him with the other Green Lanterns. So, um, <laughs> so you know, he, he's, he's an 80-year-old character. And mm-hmm. uh, when they did the New 52 version and they had the Earth 2 comic... Uh, that version of the character was gay, mm. and apparently they decided that this would be a, a trope that would follow him into this uh, rebirth universe mm. version of his. Yeah, and the oh, the yeah. two the two characters that you saw 
uh, Obsidian and Jade, who were members mm -hmm. of Infinity Inc., which was, a, the, you know, basically the children of the Justice Society of America. Mm -hmm. They um, did not know initially, and he did not know initially that they were his children, but mm -hmm. uh, eventually that mm -hmm. that was uh, discovered. And well, he was, yeah. you know, for a lot, a lot of the times, he was really the Justice Society's heavy hitter. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. since, since Superman wasn't a part of the most of the stories um, and you even see some wonderful dialogue about that in a series that if you haven't read, you really should called The Golden Age, written by James Robinson with art by Paul Smith, which is, you know, effectively an Elseworld story, but I, mm -hmm. it could fit <laughs> if you'd sneak it in, in the right way. The depiction there is is really interesting, too. So cool. Awesome. That's who he is. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, James also did mention. Did anybody get Morrison's uh, Wonder Woman Earth One, the third volume? Um, next I DCBS have not. Box. Next DCBS yeah. box. So, because um, speaking and of Elseworlds and also interesting, I was like, oh, I didn't get that Batman. I got the variant, the wraparound mm -hmm. crane with with the busy head. He's over here. So. I just love that hat, man. It's such a cool look. <laughs> it's a party hat. So <laughs> oh, great, and and I completely agree. Batman one hundred and six was fantastic. Yep. Um, so I guess I it's not even just being excited about being past the future state mm -hmm. collection that occurred, but I'm excited to get back to normal issue number, and I'm very particular about that. So I'm yep. very excited to get back to back to order, back to normal. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Steve, anything you want to add about uh, Infinite Frontier? <laughs> uh, no, I. <laughs> um. <laughs> Fafi Fufa. Uh, basically, I I really enjoyed the uh, the connective story of uh, mm -hmm. Wonder Woman. Basically, uh, you know, Spectre is actually one of my old school favorite uh, DC characters. Um, but uh, having him and Wonder Woman sort of talk uh, as omniscient beings, essentially, and going through and seeing what everything's what, what's happening right now, setting up all the stories that are to come uh, for 2021, 2022. Um, it, it was, it was really nice. It was a great, it was a great, uh, you know, method to do that. And, um, it was, it was just nice seeing her sort of like in the, in that sort of like godlike persona. Yeah. Uh, and then of but course also, she, but yeah. also it's still Diana and it's still, uh, mm -hmm. the character yeah. that you're used to just dealing with an, another facet of, uh, what has become her life. It's uh, really good. It was really, really good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one thing before, uh, uh, before we go further, uh, Sci-Fi Explosion, is that the one that we know, maybe? Mm -hmm. um, those Black Lake posters John has up are stunning, and yes, yes, <sighs> they are. Thank you. Um, <laughs> if you're going to make that gentleman happy, it's got as long as you're displaying something retro, he'll be happy. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> very, very much so. Uh, another thing I loved is I love that they set the Justice Society brownstone in Battery Park because I've worked in Battery Park for a year and a half, and now I just have these visions of me on a lunch break, like, oh, I'm going to go to the Justice Society brownstone and see if it is around. <laughs> hey there, Jay Garrick. Uh, <laughs> Security's lax. I'm sure they leave the doors wide open. I yeah. mean... People are just waltzing in all the time. <laughs> all right. We're a little bit over a lot of time. Not that that's a big deal, but that is a sign that we should start wrapping up. And when we wrap an episode of the Comic Book Bears podcast up, we do so with a segment we call the Woofs of the Week segment. In the bear community, if you find a fellow attractive, you woof at him. And we do something similar. This is where we signify something, which may be a comic book, but it also may be a film or a TV program or a charitable initiative, anything under the sun that we think you, fair listener, or viewer may be interested in the sampling. I'll start as I always do with Steve. Steve, what is your Wolf of the Week? Um, well, <laughs> you know, I, I did want to say, uh, Bill, one of your Wolfs the other week was uh, talking about the Go-Go's movie. I did watch it. I loved it. And it immediately made me start listening to all of their Greatest Hits albums. So I just, <laughs> you know, have had the Go-Go's on. Um, pretty much every time I've had music on for the past week and a half. Um, but uh, my my woof is a very odd TV woof. It is a UK TV woof, as usual. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a daily competition show, so five nights a week, uh, a show called Draws Off, um, where you have five amateur uh, life, paint life painters, so portrait painters, um, basically uh you know compete and every day one of them gets to be the life model 
uh, the live model that the other four paint. And so it's really interesting seeing everybody's styles, but also the winner of that of that day is always picked by the subject. So the model of that day gets to pick who was their favorite. And you have some interesting uh, portraits that get drawn. So some of them are uh, interesting. And, and the models uh, have had some surprises as to what people drew of them and how they were depicted. Uh, but you have some really great artists. You've got some really terrible artists, but it's fun to watch. And the host is catty and silly as in you know British hosts can be. So I recommend it. It's called Draws Off as in drawers off. Uh, and you can see it on channel four, uh, Monday through Friday, if you're in the UK. Okay, let's move over to John. John, what is your Wolf of the Week? All right, you guys, bring in another strong arm Marvel title. This one, highly controversial when it was announced last year. Much like the Superman actor, this got a lot of flack because people like to, you know, throw stones so much. You know, you say you're a fan of something, then you act the exact opposite. Some of you need to pump your brakes online. Um, <laughs> So, for real, this Children of the Atom book, number one, came out. The news came out of, oh, there's going to be a group of five younger characters that mimic or the appearance slightly or the abilities of X-Men characters. And everybody, like, lost their mind. This creator team, this creative team doesn't know what they're doing. Why are they ruining our characters? So, you know, all this hurtful stuff. You guys, if you're a fan of the X-Men, you embrace different. You try new things. Relax. Okay? Um, so, it is um, It is so... It is so uh, I was so excited to get it just because I'm like, I've been wanting to just try it out so that I can have my own opinion. Um, and so Children of the Atom issue number one um, was completely just random and delightful. The character names are so weird that I just have to share them because they're mimicking five of the X-Men characters here. We have Cherub, so that's the guy with wings that's flying. We have Marvel guy, so that's the bigger Jean Grey character. Cyclops hyphen last, so it's a female Cyclops. Gimmick. <laughs> Gimmick is a female Gambit-esque character, and then Daycrawler instead of Nightcrawler. And this is really interesting because the superhero bits at the start of the issue are fun, but the real fun is when they start talking in the middle um, at, just as kids at school. Um, and it was really fun to get to see these characters stand up to a bully. Um, so there is a lot of modern tones where a bully's like mutants are dirty and and oh you're siding with them so it really touched upon how divided our country has been um a little bit and it was really fun to see the main character stand up to a bully and say nah bro i don't agree with you sorry you know and just like kind of stand it up for herself and you know the fact that mutants are cool um there's also a lot of division on this one on krakoa going on so uh wolverine's like no we need to get these kids to the island to keep them safe and uh, Jean Grey's like, maybe we should just talk to him first instead of kidnapping him. Could be a thing. Um, so <laughs> at the end of the book, I'm going to spoil it just because it was such a, a great moment. Um, but at the end of the book, the kids try to step through the gate and walk out the other side, and they're still in the same place. So they didn't even go to Krakoa. So the plot thickens of where do they get these abilities from? Um, it's it's uh, it's interesting to me, and I really like the division it's causing on Krakoa. I love that their circumstances are mirroring that of Kitty Pride, why she can't go through the gates. So it really makes me start thinking of what the heck's going on, you know? Um, so to me, is it as solid as Hellions? Obviously not. I mean, I love Sassy Sinister, uh, but was it as bad as everyone made it out to be? No, no way. Like, you got to give it a shot, and if you're going to have an opinion, at least read the first <laughs> And don't knock the creators, man. I mean, this was a fun, this is a fresh idea, in my opinion. I liked it. So. Wasn't this originally uh, supposed to come out sometime last year, just yeah. right around uh, the start of the pandemic? So I yeah. think it, it, this, is, this has been delayed almost a full year yes. yep. um, from when it was originally announced. Yep. So, so. absolutely loved it. Um, but I, yeah, so that's my whiff of the week, though, for sure, is just trying something new and uh, going against the old grain. So. <laughs> okay, cool. Something Steve and I have both been doing in tandem, have been watching some punk rock documentaries, <laughs> Red Saunders. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, Red. Yeah, oh, but Red. that's not my wolf of the week. It carried huh. over into watching some other things. This is a film I've seen before, but I decided to watch it again for whatever reason. It's streaming on Amazon Prime for free, and I think on either Roku, at least one other outlet. And it's the film, This Is Not a Photograph, The Mission of Burma Story. 
Mission of Burma mm -hmm. were a group that were a hard labeled as a hardcore group from Boston who were active initially from 1979 to 1983. By my estimation, they were one of those groups like Husker Du and the Minutemen, though they mm. carried the hardcore label that really w didn't do them justice in a sense because they were much more complex. If people are familiar with math rock and acts like the Dillinger Escape Club, this is very much an antecedent of that. Some great songs that they put together in their sh initial short period of time together. And they broke up in 1983 because of the tinnitus and other hearing problems of the guitarist of the band, Roger Miller. And in 2002, they reformed. Though the band has since split up again, the, again, this is a 2016 film, they were active as a live unit from 2000, up from 2002 through 2016 and just confirmed the breakup very quietly and very amicably last year. It's an amazing story because this band was effectively cut off at the limbs because of because of health issues. Only released one studio album called Versus in 1982 and as part of the reunion ended up recording four more studio albums in their existence. So to see a group get a, a second chapter is really interesting and over time, you know, a lot of acts have championed them whether it's Sonic Youth or Moby. The group Versus from Boston actually takes their name from their first album and you also get to see the personalities of the three members of the band who are very different people you know one went off uh, as, as an emmy award-winning tv producer and uh, the other two stayed in music to certain degrees of success but j just uh, watching this movie again uh, and and seeing people who just seem to be really decent guys enjoying a trip that I don't think they ever thought they would be on again. Uh, and again, that's called, this is not a photograph, the mission of Burma story. And uh, it is on Amazon prime. And most of their recordings apart from some live stuff is available on Spotify. If you want to check that out. So that's cool. my wolf of the week. Someday maybe we should fill people in on red song or so. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they'd have to watch White Riot in order to yep. really see Red in, in his prime and in his prime and is still in his prime. Prime, so. yeah. <laughs> um, John, I I, uh, I wanted to make sure that we, we you know, promote Comic Book Look as well. Um, and I do have, hopefully, if it'll let me, um, the YouTube channel, which I'm trying to add to the chat right now. Uh, and let me see if I can bring that up. Uh, so that we yes. have that um, yeah. youtube.com user a comic book look and of course the featured is the main page but um, you can see uh, all of is it is it all of your back uh, yeah uh, your so, back episodes? so our episodes we used to call them issues and so we have them organized into long boxes so issues like 1 through 50 50 through 100 etc uh, <laughs> and then there's a lot of side things too like I was interviewing creators where I met the black light posters as part of that series and then a lot of one-off things including me very intoxicated at one of my birthday parties um so that was a very interesting time um but uh, definitely <laughs> do connect with us, you guys um we would love to to you know get to conversate with you during our videos as well and we've uh, mm -hmm. loved getting to know these guys here to come or comic book bears i, I always want to say comic book bears um uh but yep that is our youtube channel so feel free to subscribe um how else to connect with us um on uh, twitters uh, i am at sign john on demand just like my screen name says on here um or we can find you can find tom and i collectively at at sign a comic book look um, we are also on Facebook with the Comic Book Look, just our group. So if you do want to join to continue the conversation, we'd love just our nonstop banter. People are posting stuff all the time. It's it's fun. So Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, John, thank you so much for joining us for tonight. Thank you. Very much appreciated. I have a feeling it's going to be the first of many appearances. So. <laughs> thank you. I'm um, so glad. It was, uh, you know, I was like, kind of like, oh, when's John going to comment on the, the, the oh. live feed? <laughs> 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 
So I was like, John's really quiet today. Yeah. It's just, it's just, I was like, oh, you're so stupid. All right. So anyway, we're going to wrap this one up for good. Again, we are the Comic Book Bears podcast. You can find us on the Twitter and the Tumblr and the Instagram as Comic Book Bears. You can find us on the Facebook as Comic Book Bears podcast. If you want to listen to us, you can download us through iTunes, listen to us through Stitcher Radio and many of the other podcasting platforms. If you want to write to us, please do so by sending an email to comicbookbears at gmail.com and please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you get to see us stream effectively mostly every week. You know, we take a few breaks here and there, but we have been streaming since the beginning of the pandemic and there's no end in sight for this aspect of us, so we're just going to keep going. On that aspect, Steve is not usually in the tech seat, so Steve, thank you so much for taking care of everything tonight. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Very grateful for Brian, uh, for especially right when we started, for being there for us just in case anything went horribly wrong. (laughs) And if you're listening to the audio version, you're going to hear a wolf and an explosion, and we'll be back real soon. Take care, everyone. Wolf!